the Invisible Man meets the psychiatrist. Doctor, uh, well, thank you for uh, seeing me, uh, especially on such short notice. Or rather, not seeing me? Am I right? Huh? Uh, Go on then. Yeah, being invisible isn't as great as it sounds. I mean, sure, there's the free movies and the eavesdropping in on private conversations. But there are really some downsides, too. Can you tell me about some of your challenges? Well, for starters, mirrors are pointless, okay? I mean, have you ever tried to comb your hair without a reflection? And shaving is a nightmare. Tell you. And then there's the issue of clothes, okay? It's all fun and games until you can't find your own feet to put your socks on. I can imagine that would be difficult. And don't get me started about vitamin D deficiency, okay? Thank goodness for cheese. Oh, I love cheese. And, but the worst part is social interactions, all right? Without facial expressions, it's hard to convey emotions. It's like texting. And people keep banging into me. Will they stop it? That does sound challenging. But hey, at least I know I don't have to worry about my appearance, am I right? Bad hair day? Who cares? But remember, Doc, be careful of what you wish for. Even if you go invisible, I'm still going to bill you. I, uh... Anyway, I got this role as a poltergeist in next week's Halloween episode of the Cosmic Companion, so... Make sure to, uh, look, watch for me then. Or rather, not watch for me, because I'm invisible. Hey! Seeing the Invisible with Anand Varma. National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we are seeing the invisible. How cool, huh? It's really cool. We're going to be discussing how astronomers study objects in space which are invisible to the human eye. Uh, later on, we'll be talking with Anit Varma, creator of a new book, Invisible Wonders, Photographs of the Hidden World from National Geographic. Now, when we look up at the sky, we're going to see stars, planets, and our moon. And optical telescopes can reveal planets in detail, nebulae, and some of the other wonders of the cosmos. Now, the light with which the human eye sees objects is limited to just one tiny stretch of frequencies in the electro electromagnetic spectrum. Beyond the red part of the rainbow lies infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. At the other extreme, past violet are ultraviolet waves, x-rays, and gamma rays. Each of these bands of electromagnetic radiation represents a field of astronomy, revealing its own secrets of the universe. Now, we're going to start our exploration with the red end of the spectrum, where light has its longest wavelengths. Red Lighter, checking in. Infrared. At the heart of our Milky Way galaxy, shrouded in a veil of cosmic gas and dust lies the galactic center. Surrounded by this dust, this core is impossible to see invisible light. Infrared light, however, can see through this dusky mask. Cool stars, planets, and dust clouds radiate most of their light in the form of heat, infrared waves. The same wavelengths of light produced by television remote controls. Utilizing infrared and radio telescopes, astronomers can peer into these celestial nurseries where stars are born and witness their spectral glow. Microwaves, the same frequencies of electromagnetic waves that melt butter for popcorn for home movie night, can also teach us about the universe. In orbit above the Earth, satellites examine the Earth in microwaves, peering through clouds, forests, and haze to monitor 
our environment. Everywhere we look, an echo of the Big Bang can still be seen in microwave wavelengths, providing extraordinary evidence for the explosive birth of the universe. Radio waves. Now, who doesn't love the idea of finding extraterrestrial life? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, started searching radio waves for signs of intelligent life in the universe in 1985. You remember 1985, don't you? Live Aid, New Coke, and the introduction of the Nintendo Entertainment System. An average home cost $75,000, Rent averaged $375 a month, and you could get five pounds of potatoes for a dollar. Back to the show. Similar programs, including the Breakthrough Listen Project, are currently analyzing vast amounts of data from radio signals in the search for life beyond our planet. The study of this invisible light could result in the greatest discovery in the history of our species. We are looking forward to meeting humans as well. Most of you anyway. I've been studying humans for a while now. And frankly, we have got to talk. Next up, we're going to talk with Anand Verma about his new book, Invisible Wonders, Photographs of the Hidden World. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Anand Varma. He is a scientist photographer whose new book, Invisible Wonders, Photographs of the Hidden World, is now out from National Geographic. Welcome to the show, Anand. Thanks so much, James. Yeah. So uh, let's start off with the obvious. Uh, give us a little look into what inspired this amazing book. Sure. So I've spent the last 10 years or so as a science photographer for National Geographic. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I was aspiring an aspiring biologist. I really thought growing up that I would become a scientist. And, uh, you know, along the way through my education, I, I got an opportunity to work for a photographer one summer when I was a student. And that really opened my eyes to the potential of photography as this avenue for exploration and education. So that's how I blended photography and science. And this book really represents the best of science photography from around the world. Hmm. Give us a little bit more of a look of how you got into science and photography and merging the two when you were early. Yeah. Career. I think it all started with my childhood in Atlanta, Georgia. We had a creek running behind the woods behind my house. And so I'd go out the back door with my brother and sister and my friends and go down to the creek and look for salamanders and flip over logs looking for snakes and bugs. And every day was a new adventure. Every day was a new discovery. And I didn't actually pick up a camera till the end of high school. Hmm. But I found that a camera was this way of extending my adventures and sharing my discoveries with with my friends and family who hadn't come with me and so i really at that time enjoyed macro photography because each photograph would show you these details that you didn't notice before and so when i started down the path of professional photography i started primarily as a macro photographer but then along the way i found these other ways that photography could reveal hidden patterns and details in our world. So high speed photography, for, for example, can show us movements that are too fast for our eyes to see. 
clever lighting can illuminate details that we can't see with our eyes. And even some basic ways in which photographers frame a subject and focus our attention. So you'll see some images at the towards the end of the book that you might look at an image of a redwood tree and think, well, that's not an invisible subject. Of course it's not. It's, it's quite huge. But the way the photographer illuminated and focused on that one tree in the forest, that's a way that photography can really focus our attention and we live in busy worlds. Our attention is a million different places and photography can help, help us see those details that we would miss otherwise. All right. All right. Cinematography is a huge part of any sort of filmmaking or photography, Just setting up the way that you're seeing things. And absolutely. Uh, it really helps inform, I think your knowledge of what's there. I think that's ultimately the goal. You know, it, it starts with a beautiful photograph that's just kind of pleasing to the eye. But beyond that is the information, the context behind what you're seeing. And that kind of uncovers the next layer of understanding and connection. And hopefully that interplay between a beautiful photograph and an interesting fact and context can lead to something more, can lead, I hope, to... Uh, a sense of curiosity beyond just that one photograph alone mm -hmm. that you know being surprised by a beautiful image can actually instill a sense of curiosity about everything else around us absolutely um and of course you, this book is filled with not only images that you've taken but you also have contributions from more than a hundred other photographers, including uh, someone that we've had on the show before, who is, in, as I understand, was an early mentor of yours, David Lichwager. Oh, yeah. David is the reason I'm a photographer, actually. So yeah. I was connected to him while I was an undergrad at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, and I was set on my um, path as a, as a scientist. And someone gave me David's phone number and said, this guy's looking for an assistant. I'd never heard of him before. I thought, well, it'll be interesting to know what a professional photographer does. I, this is a hobby of mine, and this seems like an interesting opportunity. And it really blew open my whole world and, and showed me the potential of, of photography. So actually, the introduction of the book is all about David and this photograph of his that really showed me the power of for photography to really reveal hidden wonders in our world. Absolutely. David's a wonderful person. Really enjoy talking with him. Um, so with, how did you, I don't know, how did you just narrow, how did you find the hundred photographers? And, uh, it was know, a process. There's so many amazing photographs out there of large and small and things recorded over time. How did you narrow it down? I went all over the place. I went to local bookstores and libraries. I went to friends' homes who had large photo book collections. Um, I went through all the work of my colleagues at National Geographic. I looked on Instagram. I looked uh, at every photo contest, uh, sometimes in some cases going back decades, <laughs> looking at, for example, like the Nikon Small World Competition. Oh, right, right. Yeah, classic, looking, classic. Yeah, just looking for images that popped out that had this blend of familiarity and mystery, some sense of like, I know that looks familiar to me, but I don't know what's happening or what's, what's the light doing? What exactly am I looking at? I think those are the magical photographs that mm -hmm. aren't so obvious or so mysterious that they don't call attention to themselves. So those ones that invite you to look more closely, that reward your attention and then you look at the caption and you think, oh, my gosh, that's a kayak paddler, you know, going downstream. That's the hand of a gecko. That's mm -hmm. uh, the crystals of vitamin C. And, you know, you're like, wow, I had no idea that's what that was. I, I, it's that I'm trying to reward people for, for paying closer attention and teaching people my own experience, which is the world rewards you 
when you pay close attention Absolutely. to those things around you. And that's that's yeah, right. that's the key lesson from my childhood that I'm trying to take forward in my own life. And that's the gospel I'm trying to share with everyone else. That That is really beautiful. Um, and, you know, this episode has been about um, seeing what appears, what might be called invisible things up in the sky, like dark matter mapped behind me, gravitational waves, infrared, radio waves, that sort of thing. And you similarly separated this book by the reasons that that things in a natural world, this is a Terran world, the Earth world, uh, might appear to be invisible to the human eye. Can you take us a little bit about how you decided to categorize the photos that way and how that came about? Sure. sure. So when you think about, you know, invisible subjects, you know, photographs of things that our eyes can't see, the most obvious category of those subjects are microscopic organisms or tiny structures like that's that's the first thing that comes to mind but i didn't want this book to just be about microphotography that's not the only way that photography can extend our visual perception and so i thought about my work on hummingbirds for example hummingbirds they're small for birds but they're not microscopic you can see them with your own eye but you can't see their movements or you can't really see, you certainly can't see the movement of their wings or of their tongue. But a camera can, a, a, a strobe light can freeze the motion and allow you to see their movements in a new way. So I thought, okay, well, there's a component of size that through the magnification of a lens, we can appreciate the size of a subject through the shutter speed or the duration of illumination, we can appreciate time in a new way but actually even the way that photography uses light mm. to translate uh the details of a scene the, the, the actually the introduction of the book that talks about this one uh photograph of a baby flounder all right 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 this, right. this, is, the, this is not yeah. this is small but it's yeah. not microscopic right. it's sitting there it's not moving lightning fast but david figure out a way to illuminate that subject that lets you see all of its transparent ribs, all the rays of its fins, right. all these things that I saw this creature with my own eyes under a microscope, no less. And yet I didn't see all of the details of its delicate skeleton. And on top of that, the way the right light reflects and refracts off of its body and creates this rainbow of, of colors. And I thought, oh, light, you know, if you think about shining a flashlight through a leaf, all of a sudden you see uh, veins and structures that, and they're not strictly invisible. You're mm -hmm. noticing them if you know where to put the light, but it's that photographer's knowledge of light and their skill in harnessing light that lets us see details we don't think mm -hmm. about. And, and there's always in, in more direct terms of how camera sensors can detect UV light or infrared light or you know, other spectra that x-rays that uh, our eyes can't see. So there's ways that photographers shape visible light or are able to capture invisible spectra that, that allow us to see beyond our own vision. And then the last chapter is on focus. And this is a more abstract idea. You, you'll see these images of climbers and divers and uh, trees that you might think, what does this have to do with invisible wonders? And, and the idea here is you can be walking down a forest, you can be walking down a city street, and there's a million different things that are happening around you that are all technically visible to your eye. But we've, in many ways, had to create filters for our sensory perception. Like, we're bombarded with all the stimulation. We're bombarded with all of these distractions. How do you know where to look? How do you know where to pay attention to? How do you not miss all of the magic that's happening around you. And I think that's one of the powers of a good photograph and a good photographer is to look out into a messy scene and say that right there, this is the thing I want to bring out from this world and sh shine some attention on. And uh, 
teach people how to focus on. And so that's, that's what that chapter is about. Not this very literal interpretation of invisibility and invisible wonders, but a more abstract interpretation that this is invisible to our attention until it is, until our focus is brought to it by a clever photographer who uses their framing or illumination to draw attention to a subject. Hmm. And that can also help really teach us about the natural world, can't it? Because like, for instance, we've learned about hummingbirds, how hummingbirds fly. That's so. absolutely my goal is um, coming from a science background. To me, the science is what drives all of my photography. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it comes from a desire to understand how the world works. And then when there is a discovery or an observation that I can now share that that uh, discovery with others. And, and it's absolutely with the goal of helping people understand how the world works and also to be curious about the unknown as well. That can be just as fun to be confronted with an observation, a phenomenon that is completely overwhelming to say, I don't get how this is possible. <laughs> I don't get how this doesn't fit into my understanding of the world. Those are the most magical moments. Right, right. And and you can have those moments of wa of of wonder or awe through music or art. I've had my most profound experiences kind of observing the natural world, and I feel like photography is a really powerful way to share that sense of wonder. Yeah, I feel the same way about cinematography and you know filmmaking and documentary and you know making documentaries and. I just love, I think there's so much promise in this sort of syncretic blend of, of art and science. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so finally, um, I just big, of course, the big theme of the year. How do you feel about artificial intelligence and how it could um, help photography and science evolve? You know, that's a good question. There are obviously huge risks and challenges and some opportunities. Um, I certainly don't know enough to be able to tell which way it's going to fall, whether we should be terrified of this thing or, or, or celebrate this thing. And, you know, I saw a couple of uh, journalists give a presentation at National Geographic back in January about the powers of artificial intelligence when it comes to images and photography. And it was, I was floored. I, I had thought I knew what was possible and I could not believe how quickly that technology has changed. And at the end of it, they, they said, you know, all of you here at National Geographic, you probably don't have to worry about this because, you know, if you're going off to Ukraine to photograph a war, like that's a real thing that's happening in the world. There's really nothing that artificial intelligence can do. They can make a fake image, but nobody's values a, a, an artificial image of a, of a real event happening in the world. And so in that sense, as a documentary photographer or as a science photographer, uh, artificial intelligence doesn't really present as direct of a threat as it would to say an advertising photographer, somebody who's hired to photograph a sneaker well, artificial intelligence could actually make that faster and uh, potentially more aesthetically pleasing uh, very quickly. So it, it, it threatens different kinds of photography in different ways. Um, but beyond that, I mean, there's, oh, there's it, it's a field that's changing very quickly. And I think there's really important questions around kind of ownership and copyright. I mean, these algorithms are really being driven by scraping the internet of my work and all of my colleagues at National Geographic and every other photographer out in the world. The same thing is happening to writers and their, and their work. And uh, there's really open questions around the fairness of that. You know, if, if an AI is able to generate a novel or a photograph or someday a movie, and it was only able to do that by borrowing the work 
that was done by, you know, thousands or millions of contributors and that's being done without compensation and that's then threatening the livelihoods of those creators, you know, is that right? So I think we're in the, there are lawsuits left and right. I think, I think we're in the middle of grappling with this um, new technology and we'll just have to hope that we have the foresight and the patience and the motivation to get it right because it'll really have major consequences for the good or for the bad if we don't yeah i think there's just so much promise in in the way they can ask questions that we don't even know enough to ask and be able to get details out of images and videos that um could I, I think really help advance our knowledge of the natural world? Is it, is, is it, there's incredible potential along with the risks. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Anand. We really pleasure to talk with you, and love to have you back anytime. We we'll love to. Thanks so much, James. All right. And that was Anand Barma, scientist photographer with National Geographic. Check out his new book. Invisible Wonders, Photographs of the Hidden World, now appearing in your bookshop, if not on the camera. Clear Sky. These cooler events in space seen at the red end of the rainbow are bookend by the violet side of the spectrum, However, the atmosphere of Earth blocks nearly all radiation more energetic than visible light. In order to study the cosmos in these wavelengths, astronomers must live instruments above most or all of the atmosphere using balloons and rockets. Ultraviolet. Beyond violet in the visible spectrum lies ultraviolet. These frequencies of light are not only responsible for tans and revealing details about dirty rooms you did not want to know. Ew. Gross. They also tell us about the surface of the sun. NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft, or SDL, broadcasts images of the sun at various wavelengths, particularly in ultraviolet, free for the public to enjoy, free of charge. Check out the SDO cams. The Hubble Space Telescope, capable of seeing into UV wavelengths, has recorded oral or polar lights on Jupiter. X rays. No, the universe has not broken its arm. Again, X ray astronomers record the gargantuan explosions of supermassive stars in X ray light. Matter falling into black holes radiates light and X rays just prior to falling forever into the cosmic abyss. X-rays have wavelengths so short, nearly all photons of this type of radiation would pass through mirrors if struck straight on. Therefore, focusing X-rays requires mirrors that provide a glancing blow, each slightly changing the direction of photons. Gamma rays! The shortest wavelengths of light are seen, by, are seen as gamma rays. I'm Dr. Jack Flagg. I tried using gamma rays to get over shyness. It didn't work. Now every time I get embarrassed, I turn periwinkle. They call me the mediocre dude. You wouldn't like me when I'm embarrassed. These frequencies of light are so short, they pass right through most materials. <coughs> to detect them, astronomers utilize densely packed crystal plots. When struck by a gamma ray, electrons change position, releasing a photon of light which can be seen. Gamma ray bursts are the most energetic events known, releasing more energy in 10 seconds than a sun will emit in 10 billion years. These brief yet brilliant explosions of cosmic ray bursts are thought to be caused by the collapse of massive stars or the merge of neutron stars. Invisible to our eyes, they shine brightly in gamma ray light, providing insight into extreme physics. A GRB event close to Earth would be catastrophic to most life on our planet. 
In addition to EM radiation, astronomers are now even examining the cosmos by looking at gravitational waves, studying ripples in the fabric of space-time. Most of what's happening in the universe isn't visible to the human eye, but by seeing the invisible, we witness some of the most interesting events in the cosmos. Next week on The Cosmic Companion is our Halloween special. We'll be looking at the top 10 ways space is trying to kill you. We're going to be talking with astrophysicist and science communicator Ethan Siegel, host of Starts with a Bang. Be sure to join us starting on the 21st of October. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, wait, you, you enjoyed it, right? Good, good. You want to see more episodes, right? Well, of course you do. Well, all you have to do is subscribe, follow, and share this show wherever you found this episode. Easy peasy. Clear skies.